Uh, my name is Stephanie Smith. I work with uh, risk management professionals here. Um, welcome to our webinar this morning. Uh, I don't have the normal intro slides, so I'm just going to wing it. Um, but uh, we're broadcasting off a of GoToWebinar. Uh, there's a number of windows that are adjustable on your screen. Feel free to adjust them as you like. In addition, we'll be collecting questions on our interface on the right-hand side of your control bar. Uh, feel free to submit questions during the webinar. We'll take those at the end and answer any questions you may be submitting. And if there are any issues with audio or whatnot, we do have our 800 number um, that you can call and uh, get some help. We are monitoring this recording as well, so chances are we're going to catch it as soon as you do. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, again, we have that interface to work with. Um, so this morning, uh, I'm presenting on what CalARP Program 4 and CalOSHA 5189.1 are um, and why you should care about these regulations, even outside California. I'll start with a quick introduction and talk about what's changed with those, uh, those regulations. Um, specifically, they are um, the Program 4 and CalPSMR are for refineries in California. However, there is some relevance that carries over into other industries and possibly other states. Um, also, why you should even care that these regulations are out there and what you can do um, to kind of prepare for all of this. Uh, these regulations really came about um, with a, because of a series of recent incidents. Um, there's no particular incident that um, you could really point to, generally speaking. Um, but I did want to list a few of the most recent ones just to kind of remind us of why we care about our safety at our facilities and why you should care about these programs, um, whether it's a program four, where ragged gap, general duty clause, you know, programs you know, two and three, um, or even a program one facility, what, what you should be caring about and why we're here. So again, why should we care? Well, ragged gap is one of the biggest reasons. A general duty clause is next. Um, basically, going above and beyond what's just a minimal requirement for your facility. Um, general duty clause especially applying to those program one facilities where EPA and OSHA don't really touch, but OSHA is coming through and saying, hey, you know, even if you're a program one, you know, we want you to do a little bit more, and here's your requirements. Um, we did a webinar on general duty clause and how to meet those requirements a few months ago, I believe, and we do have that recording on our website if you're interested. Um, also, good safety culture. Good safety culture uh, in some studies have shown to um, to help with longevity of employees and the uh, morale of employees. Um, also, we have a professional and personal responsibility to have safe operations and safe facilities. And it all, all of this adds up and leads to business success. The more safe you are, the more preventative you are, um, the less expensive it is. So you're going to see a happier and healthier business model. So the changes the regulatory envi environment took, um, the pre-October 2017 requirements um, for, generally speaking, for all industries, and then took some of the modernization activities from some uh, nonprofit organizations and government organizations, and they came up with the program for and Cal PSMR, or refineries specifically. Again, we'll talk about how this was relevant to other industries and other uh, program levels in a little bit. So currently, um, for everyone who's not in refineries, I um, mean, you have the PSM and then the RMP slash CalARP or the other state requirements. And there's a lot of overlap, as you can see. The majority of the elements of these programs overlap and count for both programs or multiple programs. The modernization activities from these seven agencies and organizations um, all overlapped. And what they came up with was this. And uh, the federal RMP, as you can see in green, overlaps with the Cal PSMR. Um, which really doesn't have that many differences um, by itself, and, and same with CalARP. But the CalPSMR and CalARP Program 4 added um, a few new requirements that kind of change the way you look at these programs and change how things are done um, and tied some new elements into those programs. So again, just to compare and contrast, this is the current PSM elements for those um, just kind of standard Program 2, Program 3 facilities. This is a Program 3 um, map out, but Program 2 is pretty close. Um, there's a few elements that would be missing from Program 2. And we've added, uh, not from, gone from 13 to 19 elements. So we've added six elements um, with the refinery requirements uh, to 
the PSM program. Now some of these overlap and we'll talk about that, how they can be combined a little bit. So let's talk about the regulatory requirements. Um, basically between 2015 and 2017 there were several changes made um, specifically targeting oil refineries. However, these are important to everyone. Um, basically they've written program four and um, Cal PSMR, well a specific program four, to be determined by uh, NAICS codes. Um, so right now the codes that are applicable are those that apply to refineries. However, it's important to note that they could add codes um, through the a change process pretty much at any time, um, which is why this is applicable to at least pay attention if you're in another industry and, and kind of understand what these regulations um, are about because if they add in your, the code for your business model, um, you will then be subject to the program for requirements. So it's really important to at least be knowledgeable that this stuff is out here and that there is a possibility in the future to change. Also, um, technically program four and Cal PSMR can be considered RAGAGEP and general duty clause items. Um, you know, with all the discussion of going above and beyond best practice, it's really important to note that there are additional resources and additional regulations out there where you have some guidance on what else you could do at a facility to keep it safe. Um, so it is important, it's, again, it's not a strict requirement, there's no one saying this is RAGAGEP, but it's interpretable as RAGAGEP. Um, and also just the responsibility generally to do more. Um, so there's only a few, um, I'll focus on the new uh, elements, um, but I want to cover a few general ones where things change a little bit in, in uh, Program 4 and, and uh, Cal PSMR. And again, this is a requirement for refineries. This is more just informational or ragagep for everyone else. Um, but we will go through, and I'll, I'll actually go through requirements so you're well aware of what's going on. Uh, mechanical integrity section um, basically called out for procedures to meet or exceed ragagep. And that's not just documentation anymore, but certification is required on the program. So someone needs to be held responsible and sign off on the fact that they've approved this program. So they've gone a little bit above um, just the basic have a program in place and, and added someone responsible to certify. Also, the, the definition of quality assurance was expanded with an emphasis, emphasis on RAGAGEP. Um, so basically that the mechanical integrity must be suitable for the process application, um, that it must the system must be fabricated from the proper materials of construction, and that the system must be designed, constructed, installed, maintained, inspected, tested, operated, and replaced in compliance with manufacturer and any other design specifications and all applicable codes and standards. So really emphasizing on that definition of what that means um, is what they've added to the MI uh, part of the program. For compliance audits, they've called out for a certification. Um, again, someone being held responsible for the information within that audit. Um, making sure that someone has to answer to um, the contents of the audit and the results of the audit. And so, you know, going a, a step in more in depth to um, the requirements that are there. Also, the documentation of, of qualifications for each person that's involved um, in, in performing the audit. Um, they've, they've kind of, again, taken a step forward in saying that they want to hold someone responsible. They want to make sure someone is knowledgeable in what's going on, someone is knowledgeable in the process of doing an audit, and someone is going to be held accountable if there's something missed in the audit or if something happens that should have been caught in the audit. So it's really important to know that. And that's how we should be treating all audits. Um, compliance audits are, are one of the things that um, can be done very lax, and I've seen a lot of that, and it can affect your um, regulatory audit. When the, audit, when the actual auditors come in, that's your opportunity to be able to audit your own program and catch things before the regulators do. Um, so it's, it's real emphasis to make sure that you're, you're being hard on yourself when you're doing these audits or your third party's being hard on you and doing these audits. Uh, making sure that those audits are solid because that's going to help you in the long run. Um, and then employee participation, they've really emphasized effective participation. Uh, this is something that kind of gets confused or thrown around as, oh, yeah, yeah, everyone knows where the binder is or whatnot. They're really emphasizing that your employees need to know where this information is and what the contents of the programs are. Um, and, and it's even propriety and trade secret information that needs to be released to the employees of the company. Um, so it's really important to emphasize that. 
Uh, as far as new elements go, um, incident investigation for refineries added a root cause analysis, which to a lot of people may be, uh, you know, pretty standard or um, intuitive, but it gets missed a lot. So really going back to uh, providing effective methods to conduct a uh, root cause analysis, um, and the requirement establishes team experience requirements. Um, so expertise in the process involved, root cause analysis method, me, excuse me, root cause analysis method, and overseeing the investigation and analysis, um, and, and really having a team that's that's well put together. Um, also, the damage mechanism review should be reviewed during the RCA. We'll talk about DMRs in a few slides. Um, the recommendations that uh, come out of the RCA should be documented, and any interim actions should be implemented um, until final action should be documented. So if, if there's any intermediate action, say if you need to wait for a turnaround for something, um, for a final recommendation closure, but there's something you can do in the interim, that all has to be documented. Um, also, after major incidents, uh, the uh, hierarchy of hazard control analysis shall be performed as part of the RCA. I will also talk about HCAs in a few slides. These are all new elements for the refineries. Um, and then the, these reports need to be submitted to the UPAs within 90 days. So that's a new one for California where these incident investigations um, will have to be submitted directly to the agency, the local, local agency. And then there is a final report due within five months. They put a timeline on these incident investigations. Now some of these um, timelines are still uh, in the, um, the Program 2, Program 3 requirements. So it's good to refresh your memory if you don't remember those and make sure you have those within your program or in the instructions for filling out these forms um, to make sure everyone's on board uh, with the timelines, just generally speaking. Um, the RCA report also has a number of requirements. Um, basically, any kind of uh, direct, indirect, or root causes. So going through the full um, analysis of what's going on, like what happened in the incident and what caused it, even if there's something indirect. Um, all the, the additional elements that we're going to talk about in a little bit, DMR, PHA, H HCA, and SPAs, we reviewed as part of the investigation, making sure that your hazard analyses, uh, which is essentially what all of these are, hazard analyses, are in order. There's nothing missed. There were no recommendations that weren't closed. And just kind of providing a baseline for the fact that, that you were prepared and ready for this and there's, you know, maybe the root cause had nothing to do with the fact that you missed something in documentation. Um, also, any interim and permanent corrective actions need to be documented. And then this report, as many of the reports that you produce for these programs are, is retained for the life of the progress. I'm sorry, for the process. So, you know, having some kind of archival system, electronic, paper, or otherwise, um, making sure that these files stay um, together and within the company. Um, and then the agency can come in after an incident investigation, and um, the new regulations have provided a way for them to come in and do their own assessments. So they are able to come in and do the process safety culture assessment, which, again, we'll talk about. There's a lot of these new acronyms. We'll talk about all of them. Um, but they're allowed to do their own. They're allowed to do their own incident investigation, and they're allowed to evaluate your management system and human factors analysis. So there's a lot they can, they come in as far as refineries go, and look and see if there's anything additional you missed, conduct their own investigation, which can tie up um, things and possibly have you shut down for a while. So it's really important to just you know, take a step back, make sure you're in, if you have an incident, um, to uh, analyze it appropriately. And remember that incidents also include near misses. Um, so even for you guys that are program two, program three, uh, make sure that you're also investigating those near misses, nuisance alarms count for those. Um, any kind of, um, you know, almost shoulda, woulda uh, kind of incident where maybe someone came out and said, oh, yeah, we almost had a shutdown, or we almost had a release today. Well, that's really important to go ahead and look at and conduct these investigations for. So the safeguard protection analysis, another new element, um, is basically to assess the effectiveness of the existing safeguards. Um, really focusing on the safeguards. So while in the PHA we kind of take an overall general look at, at the system, this is specifically to look at all your safeguards, um, you know, mo most commonly being uh, PRVs, but it could be your control, uh, other control systems as well. Um, basically it's to assure that the safeguards are independent of the initiating event 
and that they're in the, each other. So they're looking at independent uh, protection layers, so IPLs, uh, and really looking at how the safeguards work with each other but aren't in conjunction with each other. Um, for each PHA scenario where there's a major incident, uh, an SBA must be done. So if, let's say, you have a major release, looking at the safeguards and what's going on with your system. Also, it can use a quantitative or semi-quantitative method. LOPE is very common. Um, we're seeing a lot of that happen uh, with, with different facilities, typically the higher end oil and gas um, and heavy chemicals, heavy industry. Uh, but generally speaking, LOPA can be very good for these kinds of assessments. Um, the safeguard protection analysis should be complete within six months of the PHA. Um, it typically can be done with the PHA, um, but if for some reason the scheduling doesn't work within six months. Um, and there should be an experienced and knowledgeable team. Um, that team should have expertise in engineering and process operations. It should include at least one operating employee who has experience and knowledge specific to the process being evaluated. It should have a member knowledgeable in specific SPA metho methodology being used. Um, it should consult, the team should consult with individuals with expertise in damage mechanisms, process chemistry, or an engineer specializing in control systems and instrumentation. Um, employee participation in the pro is, a, is part of this process, so having employees, again, part of the team and part of these ex uh, they say expert team members can be that employee participation, and that the PHA team can perform the spot if the PHA meets, team meets the requirements. So these can be combined teams, um, or perhaps you're doing the uh, SBA on a, day, on a day where you can bring in a few additional members of the PHA team and get it all done at once. Um, so there's some creative ways to get this done if that's something of interest to you or if it's a requirement for your the refineries. Um, the SBA is part of the PHA report. Again, it can be done in conjunction, but at least in a, an appendix or somewhat um, of that report. Um, there is the same corrective action work process as any of these other assessments. So your that action tracking log you have is about to get longer um, if you're doing a, an SBA and find recommendations in there. Um, and then the documentation must be maintained for LIPR process. Same with the PHAs, same with the root cause analysis. So it's all pretty much held to the same standard. Um, damage mechanism review uh, should be updated every five years. And if you haven't caught on by now, PHAs are every five years, the SBA is every five years, and now the damage mechanism reviews every five years. So again, there's a lot you can tie into one session or one team um, session, whether it be a few days or a few weeks few months in some cases, um, you know, there's, there's ways to overlap and to, to um, provide some efficiency with these studies, and so that's important to note if you're, you're moving in that direction, um, whether it be from a rag gap standpoint or as a requirement, um, that, you know, these are, these can be combined into a one team meeting, essentially. Um, the DMR needs to be reviewed as part of the incident investigation, we talked about that earlier. Um, it must be made available to the PHA team. This DMR information is essential for a PHA, um, especially in the, in the refinery case. Um, the team must be knowledgeable in the covered process and DMR process. Um, so the, again, going back to the expertise of um, the team and making sure you have the proper people in the study. Uh, the DMR should include an inspection and in history and materials of construction assessment, identifying damage mechanisms, um, and determining whether or not the materials of construction are adequate and appropriate um, for the process in question. Um, also, the previous DMR data should be provided um, in this report and what was found. Um, any industry-wide experience um, that, you know, for other uh, facilities, perhaps someone else had a failure in metallurgy that you haven't seen before at your facility, you know, taking that into account, making sure that, that that's in order. Um, and also, any other applicable standards, codes, and practices, so looking at a broader picture and making sure that it's all-encompassing. Um, the idea is that you're going to prevent or mitigate damage um, at a materials level, and that's really what you're looking at. Um, so damage mechanisms include mechanical loading failures, um, also the, the typical or the most intuitive uh, erosion, corrosion, or thermal-related failures. Um, and a lot of this has to go with piping, overpressure, exposure to the elements, things like that. Um, the report must be provided to the operating maintenance uh, and per other pertinent personnel. So again, getting that employee participation, meeting that 
Um, a lot of these new elements are tying into the other existing elements. Um, so you see a lot of overlap, but it's kind of, you know, one size fits all in this case, where if you take care of one thing and share that information with your employees, you're meeting the employee participation as well. Um, the corrective action training, tracking, similar, again, to PHA, Instant Investigation Compliance Audit, they should all be tracked together and the same way. Uh, if you haven't done that at your facility yet, please do. I promise it'll make life a lot easier. I've seen a variety of methods for this, uh, work order systems, simple spreadsheets, um, some kind of checklist, um, whatever it may be, um, just make sure you're doing that and doing it right. Um, also, again, the DMR needs to be retained for the life of the process, tying into some of the other elements and why these things are overlapping a little bit. And also, some guidance on the DMR. You know, this can be done in conjunction with the PHA and integrated into the report. So it can be done um, in one session, essentially. Whether that session is multiple days is another question. Um, the, the review of materials and construction can be done within the HAZOP study, if you're doing a HAZOP. So this can all be integrated in. Um, the additional nodes and scenarios within the PHA can be developed, so you can add a node or two to a PHA for the DMR, and as long as you're asking yourself the right questions and doing the right analysis, you're set and everything's together. Um, and also to address the high priority improvements, if there's anything known to be a problem um, or anything is potentially a problem due to outside information you've gotten or whatever, to address those um, first and making sure that that gets integrated. Hierarchy of hazard control analysis is essentially inherently safer technology. So how can we make this process safer? How can we improve the technology of the process rather than relying on maybe administrative uh, protections? So this should be conducted for any PHA recommendation resulting in a major incident, um, or a recommendation for scenario resulting in a major incident. So you're looking at your highest risk scenarios. Um, it should also be done as part of the MOC and II process for major incidents, again, looking at your highest risk and seeing if there's a way to engineer the risk out of the process. Um, and also during the design and review of new processes. Um, this is also uh, one of those topics we've discussed a little bit in previous webinars and we have on our website, so if you want more information about, specifically about inherently safer technologies or inherently safer design, we've got a few webinars, let us know and we can help you find those. Um, there, was a, there was one more recently and one a few years back. Um, these should be updated every five years, again, in conjunction with the PHA, so looking at how these are overlapping with the new elements and how they can all be put together into one report. Um, the team expertise, again, just goes through um, people knowledgeable in the method, people knowledgeable in the process, in, in including employee participation, so covering those three basic um, requirements with your team and having the knowledgeable people in place. Um, the HCA, HCA team, um, should include uh, risk-relevant data for each process. Um, kind of going back to your PHA and looking at what the risk ranking is for those scenarios you're looking at. Um, they should identify, characterize, and prioritize each process safety hazard. So again, looking at what's been going on with PHA, looking at how a process can be improved in a different area and how there can be a safer technology applied. Um, and then identify, analyze, and document the inherent, all inherent, the, inherent safety measures and safeguards, so proper documentation and follow-up. Um, the real goal is to identify whether safety controls reduce hazard effectively, hazards effectively and to the greatest extent possible, and also in, to include information widely available to the public and industry. Um, so really taking a good look at that. Um, for the recommendations, uh, they are essentially to eliminate hazards to the greatest extent. We just talked about that. Um, using first order uh, inherently safer measures. First order, inherently safer measures um, eliminate a hazard altogether. So they'd be changes in chemistry of a process that eliminate the hazards of a chemical. Um, for example, it'd be substituting a toxic chemical for an alternative chemical that serves the same function. Um, the remaining recommendations may utilize the second order inherently safer measures, and those would be um, measures that effectively reduce the risk by reducing severity of a hazard or the likelihood of a release. Um, those changes um, minera minimize, uh, moderate, uh, moderate, and simplify a process are usually considered. Um, an example would be redesigning a high pressure or high temperature system to operate at ambient temperatures and pressures. Um, so, so just bringing down that risk ranking and, and bringing down that hazard. 
Um, in addition, uh, that report needs to be completed within 90 days of the development of recommendations. And um, the report, again, kept for the life of the process. So these need to be kept on file for forever, essentially. Um, and then the implementation, again, to minimize, substitute, moderate, and simplify. Just simplifying the system and taking into account all the hazards to bring all that down. Um, it should be used as established guidance documents. And then the timing is key. Um, this should be as um, put together as early as possible within the operation of the process. A process safety culture assessment, PSCA, um, is essentially uh, looking at how the safety culture is at your facility. Um, it should be updated every five years. Um, ev the evaluation um, should be of the hazard reporting program. Um, the response to reports of hazards, so how quickly does management address reports maybe from operations to, haz to hazards observed in the field. Um, procedures to ensure incentive programs that don't discourage hazard reporting. Um, and having that kind of stop work authority present at your facility. Um, procedures to ensure that the process safety is prioritized over any kind of, um, uh, during an upset or emergency condition. So not worrying so much about production or operations of facility when there really is a need to address the hazard and, and not worrying about the bottom line necessarily, worrying about people's safety instead. Um, the team that should be evaluating this um, should be knowledgeable in operations, have an, at least one employee representative, so someone maybe not directly related to the uh, process, but that can represent all employees. Um, employee uh, participation, again, going back to making sure your employees know where this information is and how this is all working within your, your company or facility, and an expertise in assessing the, the process safety culture. This report um, should be written within 90 days in completion of this assessment. Again, putting a timeline on this. You can't just sit on a report, do this assessment, and sit on a report for years on end, making sure this is completed and distributed as employee participation to the, to the facility or to the employees of the group. Um, it does require a signatory to ensure that someone has reviewed it and signed off on it. Um, any corrective actions need to be completed within 24 months. So if there's anything to change, fix, improve, um, that all happens within two years of the completion of the report. Um, and any kind of interim assessment of the um, corrective action implementation and effectiveness um, needs to be done within three years of the completed report. So making sure that things are moving along, everything was done, um, and a reassessment happens. Um, and again, employees and their representatives should receive a report upon completion um, or within 60 days of completion. So making sure that employee participation happens. Management of organizational change is somewhat related to the safety culture we just talked about. Um, however, it really addresses who's responsible and a management of change of who's responsible. Um, so managing organizational changes is key. Um, conducting an assessment for, uh, prior to employment or staffing changes is really where this comes into play. Um, so the assessment should occur before reducing staffing levels, before reducing or changing classification of employees, um, any kind of changing in the shift duration, so if you're, if you're changing from an eight-hour shift to 12-hour shift, this is where that happens. Um, and it, or increasing employee responsibilities at or above 15%. They're very specific about that um, percentage point. Uh, there's also a written report required that should include, a, that needs to include a description of the change proposed. Um, so if you, if you notice, the written report will kind of sound like an MOC, but this is really applicable to the organization and who's responsible. Um, the makeup of the team responsible for assessing the change, any kind of factors that were evaluated, and the findings and recommendations. Um, job functions and descriptions um, need to be current and accurate for all positions. Um, that's very important if you're addressing an organizational change that everyone's job descriptions are accurate and complete. Um, there needs to be a certification by a manager on the report. So again, holding someone responsible, making sure someone's reviewed it and signed off that it's that they are aware that this report exists and what their requirements are. Um, that th these assessments must include a human factors assessment. We'll talk about that um, starting on the next slide. And employees must be performed if they are potentially affected by the change. Again, that employee participation and keeping your employees in the know. So the human factors program uh, really evaluates the human factors in safety. Um, so it's evaluation of staffing levels, complexity of tasks, 
length of time needed to complete tasks, um, the level of training, experience, and competency of employees, um, the human machine and human system interface, so how, we, how your operators and maintenance interact with the machinery, and if there's any way to change that, um, or, or with the controls. Um, any kind of physical challenges, the work environment, say you live in an area where ambient temperatures can get down to below zero or up above um, 120 degrees Fahrenheit and people working outside, how does that change? Maybe there's a freezer um, it, refer, you know, in your warehouse that you know, certain PPE requires, so addressing all those issues. Um, looking at employee fatigue, um, including contractors, and any effects from shift work or overtime, and making sure that those are all accounted for. Um, any kind of communication systems, depending on what you're using at your facility, and understanding and, and clarity of operating and maintenance procedures, really assessing whether or not those procedures are understood and carried out properly. Um, the, process, the analysis of process controls include error and proof mechanisms, automatic alerts, and automated system shutdowns. So really looking at um, how this, how you can automate more and reduce a human factor as much as possible. You know, any, anyone who has ever had their hand in IT knows computers aren't a, uh, necessarily always reliable, but that human error factor um, can be a big one depending on what kind of employees you have, the training involved, and everything else. And that's what this is looking at is where can you effectively reduce risk when it comes to human error. Um, a schedule for revising in the operating and maintenance procedures. So if there's anything that needs to be fixed based on this assessment, um, there needs to be a schedule in place to do so. Um, any kind of employee training that needs to be changed or addressed um, for these responsibilities that may be changing um, or any kind of operations may be changing. And then obviously, again, employee participation is required. So making sure that you have your employees engaged in this program. Um, accident Release Prevention Program Management System, which is a mouthful to say, um, is, is really just addressing um, how you're managing these programs, whether it be PSM, CalARP, CAP, um, RMP, whatever it may be, you know, really addressing how you manage this program and is it being done effectively. So reviewing that every three years, you know, is there anything to improve upon? Um, you know, it should support continuous improvement. There's always improvement to be made. I have yet to find a facility with no problems. Um, so it's really important to just continually ask yourself, is there anything we can do to improve? Is there anything we can do to fix? Is there anything more we can do to train or whatever it is? Um, you know, having that attitude of just continuous improvement. Uh, the management system should include a roles and responsibilities, um, an org chart with responsibilities, uh, the uh, procedures to ensure an effective communication for employees and managers, uh, policies to ensure the recommendations and corrective actions are communicated, again, employee participation, making sure that's happening, um, and policies to ensure employee participation. Um, and all these changes should be tracked, so this is supposed to be an ongoing and continually changed program to improve. Um, and it's basically to set standards for findings and recommendations from all your studies, um, and having stop work procedures and policies in order. Um, I'm surprised to hear that that may even be still an issue. I thought most facilities and most companies had this now just from a safety perspective. Um, but apparently the EPA and OSHA have come back and said, nope, this is what we want and this is what's required. Um, so just making sure that you have those in, uh, procedures in order if you're a refinery or you know, if you're not um, for program three, program two facility, just you know, maybe that's an option for you. Maybe that's something you want to implement. Um, some kind of method for anonymous reporting of hazards. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stigma behind, well, if I report something and someone's doing something wrong, I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to get someone in trouble or whatever. It's not about getting in trouble. It's not about losing your job. It's about being safe for everyone. And so having that mechanism in place is really important. Um, having some kind of performance indicators for the management system. Um, that Those indicators need to be going to Cal OES um, if you're a refinery. Um, so this is an option just think about you know, what kind of indicators, maybe if you're doing this assessment at your facility, um, what kind of indicators you want to look at. Um, they're, they're looking at indicators in public information. Um, basically, what the path, if there is any past due piping or vessel inspections, uh, are there past due corrective actions that haven't been done? Um, have there been any major incidents in the last three years? Um, are there any temporary repairs that have been in place too long where a permanent repair should have been done already. Um, and those indicators will 
tell you how good your management system is, how good the program is, and if there's any problems with this. Really looking at is there anything wrong with what we're doing. And the process safety management program is essentially the um, accident release um, prevention program that we just talked about, um, but this applies more to the PSM side and OSHA side, and it overlaps a little bit. Basically designating a manager to have some kind of responsibility over what's going on with the program and how to update it, um, and implementing an effective PSM program. Effective being the key word. Um, so updating this every three years, having an organizational chart, and having some kind of performance safety indicators. OSHA does not say what indicators are recommended, um, but having some kind of performance uh, measurement and something to to, um, to to basically grade you on, um, so, somewhat like a compliance audit, looking at that and, and seeing if there's a problem or if there's improvements to be made. So how does this apply to ammonia refrigeration or any uh, industry might be out there that's not a refinery? Again, going back to rag up and general duty clause, this continuous improvement of safety, um, inherently safer systems, reduction in human error, and an evaluation of safeguards are just very simple things to do, um, can be integrated into other studies or other programs, and really don't take a lot of extra effort um, to make sure that you're, you're meeting those rag up and general duty clause standards. Um, also, all of this goes into a good safety culture of your facility, um, happier employees, safe workplace, Means all means a reduced cost of business overall. Um, it is less expensive to prevent an incident or prevent shutdown than it is to fix it after it breaks. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that and seen that. And um, for those that, that may be sitting on repairs or whatnot, I, I can't urge you enough to make sure that um, that all these, uh, any required program elements or anything that may make the facility safer um, gets done as, as soon as can be um, you know, can be reasonably done um, because it is really important. So what should you do next? Um, basically, if you are not a refiner in California, um, this is all RAGAGEP uh, application, basically. But looking at the need to, to look at these additional elements, is there a reason that you might need um, a, safe, a safeguard protection analysis or damage mechanism review? Um, you know, we, we all do seismics, uh, seismic assessment in uh, California, um, but maybe looking a little bit deeper into that damage mechanism review for materials or, or whatnot. So just taking a quick look and seeing, you know, is there something we should explore? Is there something we should consider? I'm um, doing a little bit extra, maybe a little bit extra during a PHA or something like that. Um, for safeguard protection analysis, are all the safeguards adequate? Can the analysis be integrated in the next PHA or another PHA in the future? Uh, are there any changes needed in the next PHA to address other areas of improvement? Um, perhaps you could um, come together with a better team. Maybe you were missing someone who is essential in the last PHA that you can make, you make a list and make sure you have in the next PHA. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of ways you can improve that without doing a lot of extra effort. Um, for the da damage mechanism review, you know, uh, is, a, is it being implemented into the existing PHA or could it be? Is that effective? Is it necessary? Um, are there any additional analyses? You have to get um, a specialist out to test some of the materials and make sure that you're, you don't have anything, uh, any corrosion happening or something like that. Um, so that's something that can be addressed. For root cause analysis as part of the incident investigation, um, you know, is there formal methodology in place? Are you really looking at those root causes or does that need to be developed? Um, do past investigations come to the root cause or is that something to improve on? Again, looking at your procedures what you're looking at. Um, for the HCA, uh, you know, assessing inherently safer systems, is there something that can be done for that? Is your system, you know, 40 years old and, and yeah, could possibly need some improvements, maybe we need to start looking at that. Um, I know in ammonia refrigeration, a hot topic right now is low charge systems and making those safer and using alternative chemicals, alternative refrigerants, or just reducing the inventory. Um, so looking at all that for your facility and if it's a possibility. Um, you know, should this analysis be conducted, just generally speaking? Um, are there other facilities in your company that may be doing something different you need to look at? Um, it could be just because they're in a different state um, or even a different country and they're doing something different and may be applicable to what you're doing at your facility. Um, and then common industry practice as well, looking at what other facilities in the industry are doing. Um, for the PSCA, uh, you know, looking at, at your safety culture, is it a good one? Um, do your employees feel safe um, coming and going to work? 
Um, are there methods of anonymous reporting or stop work authority? Or is that something you need to implement or other areas of improvement? Uh, for human factors, um, looking at your staffing levels, um, I know at least for ammonia refrigeration uh, industry, they are very understaffed with technicians and operators and maintenance staff um, across the United States. So looking at that, is the staffing adequate? Is there a way to um, attract qualified candidates? Is there a way to work with other organizations, um, job posting boards or, or whatnot to make sure you get the right people there um, and changing how you're doing things with that? Um, also looking at the impact of staffing changes on your safety culture, uh, more or less people, will that help different kinds of people, um, more or less managers perhaps, um, different, in, in all personalities are going to be different, um, you know, reliability of people are going to be different, so just looking at a global um, application of how to reduce human factor issues. Um, and then also looking at your just management system, generally speaking, are you doing a good job with maintaining your program? There are two sides of the program. Um, there are, there's the written documentation side, which most people groan about because it's a paperwork exercise, but it has to be done. And then there's the implementation side. Um, I, I rarely see facilities that are excellent or I give them an A plus of both. There's usually a little bit of shortcomings. They may be really good with their documentation, and maybe lacking on implementation or vice versa. Uh, and a lot of facilities come really close, but really taking a good look at this um, regularly and seeing what can be done to improve the program and make everything better for continuous improvement. And with that, I'll go ahead and open up for questions. And while we're waiting for a few to come in, um, I'll just say that uh, we'll be posting a recording hopefully within a few days. We'll go ahead and, and see what we can do today. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions uh, afterwards, after maybe after viewing this a second time, um, you guys can always get me by email or, or, or get our general email, just client.services at rmpcorp.com. Doesn't sound like there are any questions. Again, my email's here if you need me. Um, and I hope everyone has a great morning. Thank you.